Welcome to Mojave Underground TV. I'm your host, Stuart Burgess, and today we're in the beautiful Dugway Range. Let's go visit some of the mines. Here we are at the Ironside shaft. I actually just climbed out of this monster. It's a double compartment shaft. Currently, it's about 180 feet deep. At one time, it was probably 200 to 250 feet deep, but unfortunately, the site was vandalized in 2010, and a lot of the lower workings were destroyed. Now, this shaft used to have a lot of timber and cribbing, and it had a head frame, but all those things were destroyed in the vandalism. Now, there are a lot of other neat things to see here. You can see over here, there are the remains of a compressor shack, or maybe an assay shop, and then there's actually another prospect over here with some of the wood cribbing still intact. Over 140 years ago in this remote corner of Utah, a small mining camp grew up. And like most mining camps of its time, the miners lived in shambles and they worked hard every day to hopefully strike it rich and make a fortune. All those miners got together and in 1870 they formed a settlement. It was called Bullionville. It had a butcher shop, barber shop, general store. It was a nice little town. It grew up around the heavy hitting mines. The Queen of Sheba, the Silver King, the Black Maria, and some of the smaller mines, the Buckhorn, the Cannon Mine, and a few others. If you're a miner and you're out here a long way from civilization, you're going to need a few basic things because you don't want to ride your horse into camp every day. So, they've got a dugout over here, which could be used for cold storage, for storing food, supplies, whatever else. And then they have their little miner shack over here. We'll take a look inside and see kind of what the conditions were like for the average miner. This is the dugout over here. And you can see it's still in pretty good shape. See, they've got a bench back in there, some oil cans and things. There's still some cable hanging on the wall and a little bit of a hose. So I'm thinking this is 1940s, 1950s, a little later. Still hinges on the door. This is really neat, pretty typical for a dugout here. You can see the timber's actually been processed. It's not all uh, rough hewn like some of the older mining camps, but still pretty primitive compared to your uh, drywalled, foundation basements of today. It's actually in pretty good shape comparatively. The door is still here. You see nothing too heavy. Not a whole lot on the walls either to keep out the, the cold wind that's blowing up this canyon right now. Now it's February, so I imagine in the, the spring and fall it's pretty nice up here. And in the summer it's probably a little hot, but I imagine it's a lot cooler than being out on the flats. So here you can see the bunk beds. And now that I'm inside, I see that there's actually, it looks like there were four, and then there was one along the back. These were doubles down here and it looks like these were singles so you could have six or seven miners in here in these different beds which is a pretty good size mining crew for the size of mine that's out here. Well here's the mine. Now the first thing you notice is not a lot of mineral content in the piles which makes me believe they didn't hit anything. Here's the shaft itself. It's about uh, 50 feet deep, and it looks like the cribbing's actually cut loose about 20 feet down and all gone to the bottom and plugged it. Double compartment, so they would have had a manway side with ladders, and the other side they would have used for haulage. Have a guy on the surface to run the haulage side, and everyone else would be down there drilling a blast in the face, mucking, hauling everything out. So this is the dump. We can learn a lot about this mining site just from looking at the artifacts down here that are left over. 40s, 50s, there's a log cabin syrup right there. It's a log cabin syrup can. That's exactly what that is, log cabin syrup. Now I've found these completely intact with the labels and everything on them. And they go all the way back. You can find them from the turn of the century and even older than that and all the way up until now, they still make them, but they don't look anything like this anymore. So while I'm digging through this, my friends Troy Emery and Jared Dangerfield are going to show you through the Bertha mine. I'll see what else I can find here. 
Right behind me here, you'll see the entrance to the Birth of Mine. This is actually a multi adit complex that was owned by the Prairie Queen Mining Company. This mine is famous for being opened in the 1890s and it operated into the, into the early 1900s as well. In fact, this mine is famous because at one time, in actually 1901 to be exact, a three-foot body of ore was discovered. Eventually, the quality of the ore body improved even more to the point that it actually reached 50% lead and 6,000 ounces of silver to the ton. This mine is also known and famous for a beautiful but very poisonous mineral called calcanthite. Let's go see inside. Okay, behind me here, I've got a bunch of calcanthite. If you see all this blue band here. Now, this crystal is a very pretty crystal. It's a sulfur-based crystal and it's, it's water soluble, which means it actually will dissolve in water. Uh, and the fact that it's sulfur will actually make it acidic. Now, this actually posed a problem for the miners because as they were working, they were powderizing the stuff that was getting into the air. They would then breathe this in to their lungs and then would start eating their lung tissues. So obviously they had to start providing miners with respirators and things like that um, so they didn't make widows of their families. This was one of the many things that they had to deal with on a daily basis uh, being miners and things they had to get prepared for and actually um, take care of to make sure that no one got hurt. We're here at the Four Metals Mine above the main vertical shaft which extends over 300 feet. During its operation, the Four Metals Mine frequently struggled. In fact, many times they could be found in the courtroom for refusing to pay employees for their hard labor anywhere they were owed from hundreds to thousands of dollars. The first big find here was actually discovered by mine manager George Mons back in 1902 at the bottom of the 30-foot shaft that had been sunk so far. Or essayed at the time at 67% lead and 59 ounces of silver per the ton, which was quite impressive. This find actually led the miners to actually dig an access at it at the base of this hill at the bottom so that they could intersect the shaft and thereby extract the ore. A small camp then grew around the area and in 1903 a concentrator was actually built to refine ores prior to the shipping process. The mine produced about $13,000 per year but expenses amounted to approximately $12,000 per year as well leaving the company with little extra cash on hand to pay their employees. Plans for building a mill were put in place in April of 2003, but financial issues prevented the mill from ever being built. Unfortunately, during its tenure, the Four Metals Mine also saw its fair share of accidents. For example, in 1907, mine manager George Montz was taking ore samples when some rotten timbers that he was standing on collapsed, and he fell approximately 85 feet to the bottom of the shaft, where he was crushed and buried beneath an array of earth and timber. And Unfortunately, it killed him instantly. In fact, at the time, another mine worker, Charles Sandal, was on shift. He actually witnessed the fall, called out to the other miners for help. They spent the next 12 hours frantically digging to extract the body, narrowly escaping death themselves. In fact, due to the foul air, anxiety, and overexertion, Mr. Sandal and other miners actually contracted pneumonia, trying to bring Mr. Mont's body out of the mine. So we've been talking a lot about ore and mining, but what happens once you mine the ore? It has to be milled down and smelted. Behind me are the remains of a very primitive smelter out here in the Dugways. Now they faced a lot of problems with a smelter like this. Primarily, that smelters take a lot of water to use. There's not any water out here that's really usable, but you can see some remains. There's a slag pile over here. You can come over here and you can see actually how this worked. You can see they've got a lot of holes in here, all along the bottom, all the holes in the brick. And they could plug those and open them up and use it to, to uh, control the airflow, which would control the heat of the blast furnaces and the actual smelting going on. You can see it actually had two main areas and the second one's collapsed completely. And this one is uh, pretty much on its last leg, but there's still quite a bit here that we can learn. The first thing we can learn is about kind of the building processes here. You can see a very primitive concrete was used. They used the native rock. Um, they're out here quite a ways from everything else, probably because this would be a stinky operation, would have a lot of chemicals and dangerous vapors and things, so they kept it away from, away from town, away from the tent camps and the mines. Now, the reason that they actually did a lot of their smelting here is because it's over 120 miles to Salt Lake City where all the big smelters were at the time. And so they wanted a small local operation 
because that would keep all of their shipping costs down. And with mining being such a hard job anyway, if you have to ship the ore for an exorbitant fee on wagon trains, then it's going to be very expensive because the railroad didn't go anywhere near here at the time. They were hoping that with the mines being so productive and so much ore being piled up that the railroads would come through and they would be able to ship everything out. But that never happened. And so a lot of the ore is still piled around today and a lot of it's been hauled off in later years to be processed. Thank you for joining us today on Mojave Underground TV.